Meet our mom, Kelly Hutchison. She is a life coach. She is a child counselor. She is a teacher. She's a parent coach. And she's a mom to us. She will teach you to stop yelling at your kids. She will teach you to get your kids to lesson. She will teach you how to never sleep with mommy guilt again. She will teach you how to be an imperfect mom. So you can help your kids be imperfect too. And have harmony in the home. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number five. Oh my goodness, my lucky number. My soccer number always growing up was five, so this is a fun episode for me. And the title is Why Do We Yell? I get this question a lot because parents cannot understand why they turn into a crazy person when dealing with their children. And I am spending my life and spending this entire podcast to kind of lift the veil so there's not so much guilt and shame and then there's awareness and consciousness around it so like Maya Angelou says when you know better you can do better because I feel like so many parents are being so hard on themselves and then they're being so hard on their kids and it's a lose-lose situation and I'm trying to create more win-win situations in the home because when there's more win-win situations in the home then there's more harmony in the home. And that's why I titled it Harmony in the Home because it's all about imperfect parenting. It's all about imperfect children. Getting there is the greatest gift you'll ever give to yourself and also to your children. Because the reason why we yell, this is the best news I have for you. You're not going to believe me, but I'm going to tell I'm going to say it anyway. The reason why we yell has nothing to do with our children. You're like, "Uh, have you met my kids? Listen, I don't have unicorn kids like you do. Okay, here's the situation. I don't have unicorn kids either. There's no such thing as a unicorn child. They are just mirroring and reflecting back to us where we need to grow. I heard that the first time from Dr. Shafali. She said that in one of her books, your children are teaching you about your undeveloped self. And I was like, man, I'm super undeveloped then. And when I was able to drop the ego and look in the mirror, I was super empowered because I was like, wait a minute. If I'm the problem and I'm the solution, then it was game on like Donkey Kong. I'm like, come on, kids, trigger me. Let's see what I got. And then not giving into the trigger was like going to the gas station and wanting a Snickers bar and getting the Snickers bar and then getting the Snickers bar. And then all of a sudden saying, you know what? I'm not going to get the Snickers bar anymore. And then when I go to the gas station... And I see the Snickers bar. I want to get it. I feel the urge. I don't get it. Then the next time I feel the urge a little bit less, I don't get it. And then over time, I don't even notice the Snickers bar when I go into the gas station. And that's the same way that I want it to be with your children and their behavior. Because when you just keep repeating the same thing over and over, nothing changes if nothing changes. And it's like Groundhog's Day. And I only know because I was on this crazy cycle for years and I was able to get off the crazy cycle and I can see the Snickers bar and it, I don't even, I'm not even, I don't even see the Snickers bar at the, at the gas station anymore. So the reason why we yell is literally 150% projection of our own inner lack that we feel. And so when our children act out, we make it mean something about us, our value and our worthiness. And projection is a very powerful psychological phenomenon that happens in all relationships. And it's pretty cool when you know about it because then you don't have to constantly project onto other people. And you can say, oh, that's my mess. And so we're not taking and using our baggage and taking our baggage out on our kids. We're handling our own Samsonite luggage on our own and not through our kids. Because a lot of times we try to recreate that old wound in current time, like I talked about in the previous podcast, of any childhood pain or wound that we had We try to recreate it through our children. So if we had a fractured relationship with our mom, let's say, then we create this fractured relationship with our daughter and that when we kind of mirror that relationship unconsciously, subconsciously, and then we're so frustrated over and over and over because you can't heal an old wound through a child. And so I remember when I was at, um, I think this was at Naples Park, I was selling 
planners, like agendas that the students had to buy at the beginning of the year. And I was selling them to the parents and they would stand in line and they were like $10 each. And I had to write down who, which child got it, what, who's their teacher was and, and, uh, that they paid and all that. And so I was selling one to a fourth grade parent and I had had her in first grade, the, the child previously, now she's in fourth grade and I was selling her the agenda and I said, okay, you know, and she said, okay, I'm going to take two. And I kind of looked at her funny, like, are you buying one for a friend? I'm like, okay, what grade are they in? And she's like, no, they're both for my daughter. And I looked at her funny again. I said, oh, she only needs one. It's for the whole year. She's like, no, I'm going to buy two. And her daughter was standing right there. She's like, no, mom, I don't want two. And she's like, oh, I know you. You're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. You always lose everything. And the daughter's like, no, I won't lose it, mom. You don't have to buy two. I just want one. I don't want two. And they went back and forth, back and forth. And I had the daughter in first grade and I don't remember a disorganized losing stuff kind of kid. And I said, oh, she's not going to lose it. Just save your money and buy one. And we were having this like three-way tussle about buying one versus two. And the mom was adamant about buying two. And then she, and I said, okay, I'm not going to battle you joking around. And then she takes out her purse and things were falling out all over the place, her wallet. And I'm not coming from a judgmental place. I'm coming from a place of understanding where it was coming from. There was stuff all over in her bag and she couldn't find her money. And then she, the money was all wadded up and she's rolling out money. Then she's going to other pockets of her purse, trying to figure out the rest of the money. Then she's like, let me do half check half. It was like a whole situation. And so this mother who was self-admitted, she's like, I'm just so disorganized. I lose everything. And I felt it was so interesting that she was projecting that disorganized energy onto her child because she was feeling like she was disorganized in a mess that she was projecting that onto her child and seeing that within her child. So a lot of times the way we feel about ourselves is the way that we're going to feel about our kids. So if we're really hard on ourselves, we're probably going to be really hard on our kids. If we're filled with a lot of self-love and abundance and kindness and talk nicely to ourselves, then guess what we're going to do to our children? Have a lot of kindness, self-abundance, love, self-love, and we're going to project that onto our children. So wherever your focus goes, your energy is always going to flow. So I'm always working on the parent and helping the parents see themselves as a miracle, as a child of God, as a beautiful spirit having a human experience, just like we all are. And I remember when I was pregnant with Lily and it took us so long to have Lily and there's so many people praying and all over the world, we had prayer chains going for miles. And I remember once she, when she was born, everyone kept calling her the miracle child. And it was, uh, and people bought shirts, the miracle child, because, you know, when you wait so long for a child, it was like, it felt like a miracle. We had gone through so much struggle, so many tears, so much miscarriage and loss and it was in vitro. It was just a really tough time for us as a, as a, as a couple. And so when she was finally here, it was like, oh, this relief finally. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This miracle child is, has been born. And my sister's kids once said, it's not baby Jesus being born, mom, like chill out. She's like, I'm just so excited. I've been waiting so long for this baby. And so as Lily grew up, she would go to a, we would go to like a baby shower and we'd go to a birthday party and she'd be like, oh, there's a miracle child. There's a miracle child. And it, after a while, it got me feeling a little uncomfortable because I was thinking, and there was other babies at this play date or whatever. And I'm like, well, that baby's a miracle too. Lily's no more of a miracle because it took her six years to conceive her. It's a miracle what the doctors could do. And then I'd be at another play date and they're like, oh, the miracle child's here. And I'm like, yeah, but all these kids are miracles. And then she'd grow up and she was a toddler and they'd still call her the miracle toddler. And it was like, wait a minute, all these toddlers and babies that we're hanging out with, they were all that baby in the hospital too. That Because if you post a picture of your baby on Facebook when they're first born, what does everybody say? Miracle, miracle, miracle. What a gift from God. What an angel. What a gift. God is good over and over and over. And it's true. You see that in a baby so clearly. And so as I grew in my faith. And as Lily grew, I started to see like, and then Grady was born and he was another miracle. And here it started all over again. I'm like, wait a minute. All these kids are miracles. All these kids were once the baby in the hospital that we were all visiting and posting pictures on Facebook and, and saying the same thing over and over. And then I took it one step further. I was like, wait a minute. I was once that baby in the hospital. And so was David. And so was my coworker. And so was that worker at Walmart. 
and so was my mail carrier, and so was my sister, and so was, and it just kept going and going and going. And I saw everybody as a baby in the hospital. It was so crazy. Even that frustrating person, they were still that baby in the hospital. I picture like when someone's frustrating me, I picture them like in their, that pink and blue blanket wrapped in a swaddle in the hospital, just sitting there. I just picture like, what would people say about this person who's now 42 and let's say gossiping about me, saying things that are untrue. I immediately go to them seeing this as a miracle from God, as a total, like we have a one in 400 trillion chance of being on this planet. The amount of miracles that had to happen for you to be on this planet, breathing this air, walking this earth, sharing this life with other people, one in 400 trillion chances. Like God does not make mistakes. So I don't think God's sitting up in heaven going, all right, I'm going to give this one a little bit more worth, this one a little less worth, this baby. It doesn't work that way. So when you see your children as a miracle and not belonging to you, then it's super easy not to yell because you don't see them as an extension of you. You don't see them as belonging to you. And what the first thing that has to happen before you can see that is you have to see yourself as that baby in the hospital. Because when you see yourself as a miracle, as you see yourself as worthy and whole and abundant, then that's what you're going to project onto your kids. It's super powerful. I'll talk to parents and they'll say, fix my kids, fix my kids, fix my kids. And I'll say over and over and over, there's nothing wrong with your kids and there's nothing wrong with you. It's just the lens in which you're seeing yourself is the only thing that needs to be tweaked. And it doesn't mean anything's gone wrong. It's just a thought error. You just need to update the app of your brain because the brain, like you heard in previous episodes, is always working against us to find fault and error and find the not good enoughness. So when we're listening to our thoughts and we're the watcher of our thoughts and we're thinking about our thinking and not believing everything that we think, it gets super fun because those 60,000 thoughts that default to negative 80%, we get to choose all those 60,000 thoughts. They don't just happen to us like a hurricane or a tornado that comes at our house. We get to choose each and every single one. So becoming a watcher of your thoughts first and then choosing with intention and consciousness And that's what being a conscious parent is, is seeing yourself as a miracle, as a child of God, as that baby in the hospital. And then you'll start to see your children that way. You'll start to see your husband that way. You'll start to see strangers on the street, the frustrating person that's driving you crazy. You'll see them as that way. And you'll just see if anyone's trying to hurt you or is hurting you, you'll just know that hurting people hurt others. And you'll still see them as as that little baby in the hospital. And it's a super cool way to not live all the time with your feelings hurt. Because you just always ask, what would love do? And so projection is a very powerful thing that we do to our children. So we're yelling. And when we yell, it's actually a snapshot of what we do to ourselves inside of our head. Say what? Because we see the child as belonging to us almost as an extension of ourselves. And so when we see them as an extension of ourselves, as a mini me, which makes me cringe every single time people say, oh, Lily's a mini me. I'm like, no, I don't want a mini me. I want a mini Lily and I want a grown up Kelly. And I want a mini Grady and I want a grown up David and a grown up Kelly raising these beautiful souls. Both my, I was a big soccer player, as you heard in previous episode. And I'm so glad that neither of my kids play soccer because I would be so worried at every single game. Are they playing soccer because they love soccer? Are they playing soccer because they want to be like mom, like mom? And every day people are like, aren't you glad? Aren't you sad that they're not playing soccer? I'm like, actually, no, because even if it was their passion, I would be like, are you sure you're playing this because of because you love soccer? (laughs) Because I'm so I'm so conscientious and so conscious of not projecting stuff onto my kids. I'm like, I don't want to project my love onto soccer to them. I'm like, I tell my kids all the time, like question everything, question everything we do. Because I want them to have their own voice. I want them to hear their own voice. I want to hear their own thoughts. I don't want them just to think what mommy thinks is what they should think and what daddy thinks is what they should think. I want them to have their own free will. I want them to be, have that inner voice so strong that it carries out into the world. And I want it to be different than mine. And I want it to be different than David's. And the only way it can be different is if I tell them every day to think about their thinking and challenge everything. This is just one way that daddy and I do life, but this is not the only way. There's 150 million right ways. So it kind of gives them that freedom to be like, oh, I'm my own free will. I don't have to be enmeshed and codependent. And it kind of gives them that that chance to fly on their own and not have to fly under us like we're in charge. 
And so when you are yelling and screaming, it has nothing to do about your child, it has everything to do with an extension of how you're talking to yourself. So it's kind of like a peek inside your own brain and you finally now have an outlet. And so you almost, the brain starts to justify it. Well, that's the way I talk to myself. So why wouldn't I talk to the kids that way? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that super empowering? And it's not from a place of beat myself up. It's like a place of like, let's clean this up so I can clean up the way I'm talking to my kids. Because the way I'm talking to my kids is the way I'm talking to myself. And I only know this because I used to be so hard on myself. And guess who I was super hard on? The kids and David all the time. And now I'm aware of what I'm thinking because I know that my inner voice is going to be their inner voice because the inner voice is so loud. So it's not anyone's fault. It's not your fault. It's not the child's fault. It's just an inherited way of thinking that was probably passed on to you because guess what? Your parents did. Your parents projected how they felt about themselves onto you. So you're seven years old and your parents are calling you a a brat or lazy or S-T-U-P-I-D. I can't say that word out loud. It's like the worst word ever. And so you took it as a fact, but all it was was a snapshot of how they felt about themselves and how they were talking to themselves. But the inner child, the little girl in all of us and the little boy in all of us didn't know any different. We took it as fact because our parents said so. If our parents said it, then it must be true. But guess what? It wasn't true. It was a reflection of how they felt about themselves. So if your parents were coming from lack and low self-esteem, not good enoughness, any problems with anger or any problems with depression or anxiety or alcohol or any type of substance abuse, then they projected that onto you and only magnify that within you. Conversely, if your parents were coming from abundance and kindness and love and felt that way about themselves, then they projected that onto you. And you took that as fact. Isn't that amazing? A small example. I like to give big examples like the alcoholic father married and then ended up marrying an alcoholic husband. I like to give big examples like that. I like to give little examples too. Like, perfect example. I do not like my forehead. <laughs> I'll just say it right here. I feel like my hair recedes too far back. I have like a five head. And it's not even my forehead's that big. It's just like my widow's peak. It goes so far back. I'm a, I have like a receding hairline. I think I'm going to be bald. And so I usually have bangs on or I usually have a headband on. And my headband is always covering up the, the peaks. I don't even know what to call them. They're like little V's of my hair that goes back too far. And so if I walk into Walgreens and I don't have a headband on and I just have this exposed forehead, I literally walk into Walgreens thinking everyone's seeing my forehead. Because I am insecure about my forehead, so I'm projecting that onto everybody in the store. And guess what's happening? No one is looking or thinking or talking about my forehead. <laughs> Isn't that crazy what we do? But whatever insecurities we have, we project that onto other people and we think they must be thinking that. When they're not thinking about anything, they're like, where's the Nutella? Where's the checkout? Where's the sneezing medicine that I need for my kids? Because the ego thinks that it's all about us. And it's really not. And I was having a parent conference with a first grade mom. I remember this and I was, um, I was just praising on the little boy. I was like, your son is so sweet. He's so kind. He's so gentle. If someone drops their crayon, he's the first to pick it up. I was just like laying it all out there, how amazing her child was. You know what she came back with? He doesn't do that at home. He's not like that at home. He's a, he's a terror at home. You won't believe him at home. I'm like, oh, at school, he's an angel. Like, yeah, you won't believe it at home. He's just a terror. And I was like, no, at, he's a really nice boy. And he's like, no, he's not. And I was like battling with his mother about how nice her child was. And she was telling me how unkind he was. And what happens is whatever we think about our child is what we're going to project onto them. And that's what we're going to find. So the brain is like a metal detector at the beach. And it's always seeking whatever you tell it to find. If I, when I was buying my new car, well, it's not new now, but when I was getting a new car, it's like three years ago, I was like, I don't know what color car to get. And so I was like, I think I'm going to get a white car, but I wasn't sure about the white car. I think I told you this in a previous episode. And so I was like, I think I'm going to get an Acura. 
And so I was looking and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's an Acura. There's an Acura. Because I was telling the brain to look for an Acura and all I would see on the road was Acuras. And that's the same way with our children. Whatever we tell them the brain to focus on, if we tell the brain to focus on what a miracle they are and they're a gift from God and they're a one in 400 trillion chance of being on this planet, then guess what we're going to see in our kids? That. And then we're going to magnify that in our kids. We're going to actually see it in ourselves first. And then we're going to project that onto our kids. So projection is a phenomenon, but it can also work for you and it can work against you. And once you're aware either way, then that's when true power comes. Because your parents actually lied to you about how they felt about you. Whether it was good or bad, it was just a reflection of how they felt about themselves. So my parents had a very high opinion of themselves and were very confident and filled with abundance and filled with love and filled with kindness. And so they projected that onto us and they were very affirming. They were like, we're all, they always said, we're so proud of you, Kelly. We're so proud of you, Jennifer. We're so proud of you, Molly. We love you. You can go rob a bank. Our love is unconditional. And that felt really good. So you know what I did when I went in my adult relationships? I wanted it all. I was a crazy people pleaser. I wanted my boss to affirm me. I wanted my coworkers to affirm me. I wanted my friends to affirm me. I wanted the mom on the PTOs to affirm me. I wanted David to affirm me. And I wanted my kids to affirm me. I became like this crazy people pleaser because it felt so good that I thought that their opinion of me was what I needed everybody to think about me instead of me thinking about myself first. And then if other people thought it great, and if they didn't, that's okay too, because they're just projecting how they feel about themselves onto me. Does that make sense? Isn't that amazing to know that other people's opinion of you has nothing to do with you? It's their opinion of themselves projected onto you. What? That's so crazy. And it was so amazing. I went to, um, every year Dr. Shafali has um, a parent, a conscious parenting conference. It's life-changing. I can't recommend it enough. It's usually in the fall. And last year at Evolve, she said something that made me, every year she says something that makes me fall out of my chair. One year she said, people pleasers are selfish. And I was like, say what? Because we are just trying to get something from someone else to make ourselves feel good about ourselves. And I was like, uh, yeah, I think that's what I do. That's exactly what I do. I was like, wow. All my people pleasing is selfish. I'll do another podcast about people pleasing. Oh my gosh, it's super cool. And this last time she's, oh, another time she said, no one, this uh, this is another time I almost fell out of my chair. Every time she speaks, I want to fall out of my chair. This time she said, you know, no one can push your buttons. And I was, it was like, that was one of those lightning bolts. I'll, I'll do a podcast of like my ahas and my lightning bolts. Cause I've had a lot of lightning bolts. She said, no one can push your buttons. I was like, say, what did you just say? And this last of all, which made me fall out of my chair, she said, when I'm working with a client, she's like, she's a psychologist. When I'm working with a client, I don't need to go back and ask about their childhood and ask about their history and ask about their third grade teacher and their seventh grade experience and what their relationship with like with their parents and with their siblings and with themselves and what they're feeling. What what was their opinion about themselves as a child? I was like, really? I think that's usually what most psychologists do. She said, I don't need to look back and look at the past. I don't need to look at the third grade and the parent and the dynamics in the family. All I need to do is look at the present and see how their life is and see how their four walls is and see what their life is set up like. And that will give me a snapshot into what their childhood was like. I was like, what the what did you just say? Isn't that amazing? Because the brain likes all those patterns. It likes all that same old, same old. Like I said, it likes to seek pleasure, avoid pain, and be efficient. And so when the brain is growing and developing, it's like creating those new neural pathways when you're really, really young and it's writing on the slate of who you are when you're really, really young. And then it gets like crystallized around 25. And then the brain's just like, all right, let's just keep coasting. Let's just keep doing the same old, same old. And the cool thing is we get to take the parts that we like and then we get to remove the parts that we don't like. We're not just a victim of our childhood. It's not like beating up our parents. It's awareness about how we were raised and what messages we were told when we were younger and then challenging them all. Even the good ones challenge them all. It's crazy because like I grew up and my parents were they were huge nappers. So I'm a huge napper. And I tell people I nap and they think I'm like the laziest human being on the planet. I'm like, really? Napping is lazy. Like, I just thought that's what you do. You take a 20 minute power nap. It's like part of like, it's like brushing your teeth. How could you not 
brush your teeth. And I also grew up and everything went down the garbage disposal. Everything, orange rinds, chicken, cucumbers, apple rinds, everything went down the disposal. It was a way of like cleaning the garbage disposal. You put ice cubes down there. You want to like make the knives or whatever's down in the garbage disposal. You want to make it work. So then it kind of like agitates it and like keeps them sharp. It's like a way of sharpening the knives down there or whatever's down there in the garbage disposal. And so I grew up my whole life like pro garbage disposal. Everything goes down the garbage disposal. Uh, Mary David, he's very anti-garbage disposal. He's like his, his parents, I think they grew up on a, on well water. So they had a septic tank or something in their front yard. I'm not sure how it works, but nothing went down the garbage disposal. They didn't even have a garbage disposal. So we're always having this garbage disposal debate and I am so strong about it and he's so strong about it. And so the other day there was a Subway sandwich, like a, probably an inch left and I left it in the sink and I was going to put it down the garbage disposal, but the kids were sleeping. So I was waiting until they woke up. He sees it in the sink. He's like, you cannot put this down the garbage disposal. Mind you, we've been together since 1999. We're still having this garbage disposal debate. And I'm like, uh, yeah, you can. He's like, no, you really can't. I'm like, the bread's just so mushy. It's just a little turkey. And so, you know, so he throws in the garbage. He leaves for work. I put it down the garbage disposal. So I'm like, you know what? Let's ask on Facebook. Let's settle this debate once and for all. I'm always posting little things like that on Facebook. And I'm like, all right, people, this, this, this uh, sandwich, I can't give it to the birds because it's old. It's like a day old sandwich. It was from Lily's lunchbox from the day before. Um, it's day old sandwich. Can't give it to the birds. Can't give it to the dog. Would you put this in the garbage disposal or would you put it in the garbage can? And I had like 300 comments and 99.9% .9 of them were the garbage can. And I was like, what? And there was all those like plumbers that were commenting and my husband's a plumber. Or my best friend's a plumber or this, I know a plumber. And they said that anything in the, on the garbage, and it was like all anti-garbage disposal. And it was like, wait, what? It was like finding out Santa wasn't real. I'm like, are you kidding me? So it was like this belief that I had grown up on. And it's a silly example, but think about how our other beliefs are so formed. It was, I, I would have stood in a court of law defending my love for garbage disposal because that's what my parents told me to think. Isn't that crazy? So think about how many times that your parents told you something about yourself that they were actually projecting onto you. That was an opinion they had on themselves and they were projecting that onto you and you took it as fact. Say what? I think it's super good news to know because we get to, as we grew up, we become an emotional adult. We get to create our own four walls and we get to create our own belief system. We get to challenge it all and not just believe everything we've been told because we've believed it so long. Just because the neural pathway was placed there when we were seven doesn't mean we have to believe it and, and live it out at 37. It's super, super cool to know. And it's super good news. And I was at the Tony Robbins event, Unleash the Power Within and then Date with Destiny. And he said, every child is, is born with this huge, throbbing, beautiful spirit. And he had his arms out as wide as he could. And as they get older, the society and parents and coaches and teachers and, and societal norms starts to shrink that spirit. And I'm like, let's let the spirit fly. That's why our children remind us about our throbbing spirit, that huge spirit that we had when we were three years old and we didn't have a care in the world. That's what our children are here to teach us about presence and about happiness and about joy and about feeling all the feels. I mean, if you see a toddler, they feel their feelings. That's a good thing. You want that to happen. You don't want to push it away. And so I just want to encourage you to have that awareness of what you're projecting onto your kids and what you're recreating from your past. And you don't have to recreate it. You can think about it. You can journal it, but you don't have to recreate it through your kids because through your kids, you get to have a brand new relationship. And if you had a great relationship with your parents, then, then take what you liked and duplicate the parts that you liked, but duplicate it with your own voice. And if you didn't have a childhood that you loved, you get to recreate it however you want. We get two chances in life to have a parent-child relationship. Our first go at it, we don't have any control over it. We don't have any control over where we stood in line. And if your parents were awesome, then that's awesome. But it doesn't make you more awesome because your parents were awesome. If your parents were less than awesome, it doesn't make you less than awesome. It just gives you an insight of how they felt about themselves that they projected onto you. So you just give them love and empathy and compassion that they were doing the very best they could. And you kind of get a peek of what they were thinking about themselves. 
but their worthiness and their value does not go down because of how they did as how they did as a parent. And we don't have to blame and shame and guilt them. We don't even have to have the conversation with them. It's just that understanding and that aha. And the way if they were negative to you, they were just negative. To, they were 10 times more negative to themselves. So if you have someone who's being really hard on you, they're being 100 times harder on themselves. So you give them compassion and love like, wow, that must be really hard to live in a brain that's just constantly beating yourself up like that. Instead of just thinking, wow, I'm a really bad person. It has nothing to do with you. So I just want to encourage you to understand why the yelling is happening. Because when you understand the why, then the how to stop is much easier. It's not about finding more patients at the store. Parents tell me all the time, I just need more patients. I just need more patients. I'm like, no, you do not need more patients. You need more awareness. Because if you're waiting for patients, it's like waiting at an airport for the bus to pick you up or being at the bus station and thinking an airplane's going to pick you up. It's simply not going to happen. And think about how long you've gone waiting for that patience to like strike you. It's kind of like motivation for a workout. It doesn't happen. It happens afterwards. And when you're aware, like Maya Angelou says, when you know better, you do better. And what do you want to model and embody for your children? So then you can project that onto them. And how do you want to think about yourself? See yourself as that miracle. See yourself as that baby in the hospital. Think about your thinking. Think about how you're talking to yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. Live in grace. Tell yourself you're doing the best job you can because then you're going to see your kids as doing the best job that they can. But when you're so super critical and judgmental of yourself, you're just going to be super critical and judgmental of your precious, precious miracles from God. And you don't deserve that and they don't deserve that. And it's no one's fault. It's not your parents' fault. It's not your fault. It's just the thought error. And it's just an update of the app. That's all it is. And that's the best news ever. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your kids. You have the exact child you're meant to have. And you're the exact parent to raise that child. Like what a gift that is. And people can say whatever they're going to say. But you know that that connection you have with your child is so strong. And they know it's so strong because they're looking at you going, you are the apple of my eye. Like I just, I look up to you and everything you say and do, I take as fact. So don't we want to make sure that they, those facts that were doling out to them is positive and loving and kind and abundant. So we have to make sure that our comments to ourselves are loving and kind and abundant. So I can't wait to hear how this episode resonated with you and how you're going to clean up your inner dialogue so you can clean up how you're talking to your kids because the way we talk to ourselves and the way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. So we have such a powerful impact that we can make on these impressionable little miracles from God. So let me know and thank you all for listening and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hey, mamas, thanks for listening. If you had any ahas, clicks, or those lightning bolt moments while listening, you have to check out my free parenting bootcamp where we take all of this to the next level and we try to create even more awakenings for ourselves so that we can connect more with our kids and never yell at them again. You can sign up at www.coachingkelly.com and if you really wanna fill up my love cup, send me an email of what your aha was, what your click was, What was that lightning bolt resonating moment while you were listening? I want nothing more in life than for you to have harmony in your home and to learn how to be an imperfect mom like me, which allows your kids to be imperfect too, each and every day. Thanks for listening.